Right, good evening everyone. Welcome to Holy World's Revival on this Thursday, 10th of November 2022. And this is actually take three, which is a recording because I had problems yesterday. And then we had a power cut when I did the second live attempt earlier on this evening. So I'm going to do a recording and I'm going to do the recording live. I'm not going to bother to stop and start and do edits like... I might do if I was doing YouTube. So it's still going to have all of the errors and the technos and all the rest of the problems. But I hope you enjoy this. The only thing that's missing, I don't get your live comments. So I'm avoiding that. But please comment. And I'll try to be present when it's broadcasting because this will be still like a, a live broadcast when I put it up on the Facebook and YouTube. And... Uh, Anyway, enjoy listening to what we've got. So thank you for joining me. This is our weekly time of exploring holy wells and sacred pools and blessed water and exploring the water mysteries, the water well and pool traditions, and whenever possible, news of holy wells being restored when our guests that we're trying to line up who are looking after various county wells uh, are actually on this program. So hail, howl, whole, and holy good health to you all. And uh, through this edition, uh, I'm going to explore the folklore and stories of uh, healing wells. So I, I'm sort of looking forward to that and um, lining things up for you here. Right, just having a bit of a practice run, which is fantastic. Everything seems to be working well. So... Um, as you know, Holy Well Revival and Nature Folklore Sessions, the video and sanctuary support, is supported by our subscribers. But I'm not going to go through all that waffle until we get to the end this time. Uh, so thank you for joining and how you can support and help out. It's always uh, greatly uh, appreciated. So anyway, on we go. Healing at Wells. Uh, well, it always... Uh, seems to be an obvious subject to cover about Wells because... Um, what do people go to hell, Holy Wells for? Well, there's various reasons, but certainly uh, <clears throat> not so long back, uh, the cause was to go for the cure, as they call it, uh, at Holy Wells. And uh, it may be uh, thought, then why cover uh, this as it may be assumed that Holy Wells are simultaneously healing wells? There you go. There's an I was wells. I'm not quite sure where that is. And that one I'm going to be talking about uh, later. I hope it comes up again because it's quite a uh, fantastic story with that one. And uh, I don't want to tell it now, but I'll tell you a bit later. If not, I'll slide back to that picture because it's fascinating. Uh, that's actually at um, uh, Castle Magnum. Uh, is, have I got that right in county court? Uh I'll have to think about that one. It's uh, named after the cider. What's the cider in Ireland? Uh, it must be Magnum. I know near that well uh, Donovan lives uh, by it. Anyway, I'll come back to it. I hope to talk about it because it's a lovely story. Anyway, referring back to our episode Cursing Wells, which was last week, um, not all of them are healing wells, so it might not appear to be, but the water of most holy wells and even those that eventually became cursing wells are believed to flow water that is healing for something anyway. So why else would people visit holy wells for healing? Now, access to public health care was actually quite rare not so long back, probably from 70 years ago and before. People just, most people just couldn't get the health care. So the local well was regarded to be the central site of their healing and to get the cure, as the locals would say. And often uh, there'd be a local healer, and that's the best picture I've got for that, who'd be present at the well. That's Doonwell, an old picture of Doonwell there. And at least be living nearby and be available for service for a not too demanding uh, exchange. And I think, uh, come back me, I think we can too easily underestimate the healing power of water and its chemical structure of how just the chemical structure itself is very much part of the healing and how that works on top of the folklore, which we love to hear, and I'll be sharing that with you, and even the spirituality of being present at the wells. Now, the underestimation of healing I think is like our underestimation of how potent water is 
when we use it for cleaning and for hygiene. We always think we've got to put detergents and soap and all the rest of it in. But without any of those additives, water is still a very powerful cleaner, um, even if we don't have access to soap. However, water's cleaning abilities can be choked up with too much presence of chemicals, which happens uh, in great amounts these days with a runoff from fields and what people throw into the rivers, what comes out through the sewage pipes, etc. So it's quite a concern at the moment because what happens, you put these toxic chemical things into the water and instead of it naturally chelating with things that help the water along and help its own nutrition, uh, all this uh, gunk, it clings to the uh, ions, the electric charge of the water molecules, and uh, that dilutes and closes off the physical magic the water can provide us. So for healing, there is an amazing natural process, and it's quite mysterious, and it's known scientifically as chelating of the minerals from the deep earth. This is what water does it go travels comes from the swallow holes from the rain from the mountain goes deep down gets pushed along the underworld the underground and then somehow it comes up and then we have our sacred spring and that gets kind of has some additives by humans becomes a holy well but meanwhile as it's made that journey it's picked up minerals there's a huge charge on the water, so the minerals are chelated. And if you think about it, even our own bodies, a lot of people spiritually say that our bodies are temples. And so our body temples, they're all manufactured in the womb from all these minerals that the water picks up underground, same stuff. And I also believe strongly uh, in the fact that we've got our temple bodies. It's only partially minerals. A lot of our body, uh, the liquid part, is water. And uh, for mature people like myself, that's about 70% is water. And I believe uh, that the water carries our life. It car also carries our memories as well. So minerals, when they come in through our water and through our food too, they replenish what we actually lo uh, lose through our day-to-day -day deeds, normal process of nature. And so, of course, well, if a, a spring or a holy well is well-maintained, it remains healing and is often very invigorating on us. It's, to me, it's a bit like, uh, you know, the, when I say invigorating, it reminds me of putting your feet in a bowl of Epsom salts, how invigorating uh, that can be. Now, I'm thinking of some holy wells as well, where humans have extended from the spring, and this happens most of them that are called holy wells, so they've been extended, and they... They tend to have walls and they have steps down into the water just where the spring comes in from the underground. And then some of those extensions, they have foot baths and sometimes there's submersion baths. So the water goes, bubbles up into the sort of circular area of the main well uh, that people get the water from and there'll be steps down into it probably. Then you could have a foot bath and then you could end up having a a, a submersion bath, and then off goes the stream, flowing off to the river or maybe the nearby lock, wherever it goes. And uh, so those, as I say, they're placed in the immediate stream uh, that flows directly from the well. And uh, the footbathing area, let's see, it gets something up here. There's a, a famous place where I can show this. Uh, Tully Well, a lot of you would be familiar with, it, with this. Tully Well which most people would know as the Kildare, the Bridges Well of Kildare. The actual original, and I'll show you a picture of that at the moment, was the Wayside Well. And that's a pretty one. And these days, that's actually a more relaxing one to be with. But uh, years ago, there was a busy road that ran beside the Wayside Well. And that busy road got busier, the road got wider. And the Kildare Council decided it was too dangerous for people to hang around uh, the well there. They might get run over. So they uh, kind of transferred the reverence to what's the well there in Tully, in the Tully townland, because that would be safer for people to go to. And so the people went there, and they made a fantastic job there. But a lot of people are at peace there, and a lot of people will visit there, and they won't even get to the wayside well. But... That big, busy main road is no longer there by the wayside well. 
uh, it's moved over again. And that's actually the road by the wayside well is a cul-de-sac. It's further away from the well. And so the wayside well is private. It's in just outside the car park of the um, Japanese gardens there and also the stud, the Kildare stud. And I'll have a picture of that in a minute, but let's, I'll give you a couple more here at the Tully Well. So there we go. I'm going to bring that picture up again for another reason a bit later on, but you'll be familiar probably with that well structure at the Tully Well. And to you, that's that's some Bridges Well. But we got this. Look from Bridges Well, get behind that cross, and you see the stations there, and you can see the structure at the end where you'll be familiar with, with the bronze, I think, as sculpture of Bridget. And when you get there, there you go, you get a foot bath. A lot of people love, when they visit, love using that foot bath there uh, that comes from the stream coming out of the bridges well further along. And there's a closer, there you go, place to be, sit down, put your feet in there. And uh, I suppose it's regarded as being contained with the archway over there. And I'll sh here we go. I think this is the wayside well. And you see, that's quite simplified. It's not as so primitive. You can actually see the steps there that you can go down. And I've been there and people have been sitting along that sort of half moon wall, keeping their feet into the uh, well, which springs up there. So that's where it springs up. That was obviously a bit of a, a wet day there. Anyway, even um, as I say, the wee side well, I, I think I'm supposed to have another picture. Let's see if I got another anything else for you. Have I missed something? No, I think I've got it all that of that one. So I'll move on a bit. Uh, Breedswell, this is Breedswell, uh, is also a Bridges Well, it's in the south of the county Ross Common, and uh, this uh, is in a large establishment, it's been well and truly customized. Uh, no, that's the bridge as well. That's the wayside. There you go. We're looking in. We're looking in where the stream is. And I'll, I'll have a closer look. But uh, the stream there, uh, the well is the other side of that wall. But the stream coming out of the well is there. And you can go and sit down there and put your feet in. I think I've got a picture of that. There's a font there. I'm not quite sure what people would use it for. Probably signs of the cross and put holy water on their brow and whatever they do before they actually enter. So it's like a cleansing ritual that you do before you actually get to the well water. And there you go. There's a place that you can actually sit down and uh, kind of uh, do your healing, uh, do your contemplation, your prayers, and so forth. Do I have something else? Yeah, that's the well itself. It looks pretty ugly there at the moment, doesn't it? And... Um, it's been cleaned up a lot. I haven't been back since it's been cleaned up, but apparently the local people have been there and the water's luscious again. It's uh, fantastic. And uh, another thing that's interesting, see there, there's the water coming out from where the bathing area is and it comes out there and what it does, it keeps going. And that building over the other side of the fence is a local school. And that water actually gets used by the local school as well. So I find that... Uh, Fascinating. That's uh, wonderful. That, that is, well, it's not only used for healing, there's a functional purpose as well. Oh, yeah, uh, another one. There's a kind of worn out bull on stone. And some people like to take the water, the rainwater that's fallen into the bull on stone, because there's quite a widespread belief that that water is actually better for warts and skin conditions than the holy well water is. Uh, there's a lot of belief in, in that. Right. Uh, let's see what I've got coming up uh, next. Ah, well, yeah, we were in Moray, Scotland. Let's show you this one. And Moray uh, in Scotland, uh, I was visiting family there, and we went to visit the, one of the picked wells in Burghead. There's two picked wells there. And here's a sign for the first one. You, you can read it a bit while I blab on a bit. Um and I'll show you a couple more pictures from there. Uh, it's an enormous place. And there you go. There's stairways. It's like a big cairn. I didn't get the whole picture. And you've got this st uh, stone stairway that goes all the way down to the well there. And I've got another one. Let's show you that one. And you get there, and there's a kind of fence to stop you actually getting in because it's actually a submersion well that one it's huge it's this huge bathing area you can actually see it i think there and it was also 
not only used for baptisms and for cleansing. And I'm not sure of the actual details, but it was actually used as part of funeral ceremonies, as well as the birth baptisms and the things that uh, you may be familiar with. And that's uh, a closer up of the back. It really is huge. I can't really get that uh, into perspective. Uh, Oh, with photographs, and I was helped to move my daughter Ivy for that one. Anyway, for uh, all you Christian and ancient script followers, uh, you may think when I'm talking about the wells like that for baptism and for funerary, even the well I've got on the screen at the back here, you probably might think of Middle Eastern stories like the, um, the curing of Namus leprosy after being instructed to bathe in a specific part of the River Jordan. This is about the best picture I can get. It's a modern, it's probably done for a modern drama, but it gives you the idea of bathing in the River Jordan and the story of, and I think they're acting out name as leprosy story with that one. And, uh, and also there are the stories of Jesus uh, healing a blind man through submersion in that, this place, the Pool of Siloam. Uh, or Soleum, I'm not pronouncing it right, Siloam, Siloam, and that's looking down, and that's actually been modernized, and that's what it was like not that many years ago before people came along and modernized it, almost did a new Grange on it because it was popular with tourists and pilgrims, and this is a close-up one with uh, down below, and that's where some people sit and bathe and keep their their feet in that. And also it seems that um, many uh, of the intentions of pilgrims anyway, no matter where they go, the intentions of a pilgrimage is usually to travel to pools of water somewhere rather than pilgrimages to temples. I know people coming to Ireland, they, they call them pilgrimages when they go to stone circles, uh, to cairns, and ancient human-made structures. But around the world... The idea of a pilgrimage seems to be more uh, for reverence and unity and community as well within the water. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, That's I bring that back up because through many uh, water springs, there we go, there's a water spring there. I'm not sure what country that is. We're still in the Middle East, obviously. But there's stone surroundings there that have been made convenient uh, uh, for human use. The woman there is obviously getting water from the well, but there's definitely some aids around that that's made it easy uh, to actually get the water. For a start, there's no bending over. You can just put the pot down and deal with your water on the stones. They're like a bit of a table. So we do uh, do these conveniences, which is um, quite lovely. Um. Right, I'm messing around here. Uh, but this happens at a lot of the holy wells. We have built things with stones in ancient times and in modern times in order to, because we try to enable access to make it easier and be more comfortable to do what we feel that we want to do at these springs and the holy wells. And it is lovely when there are seats, uh, when we can kneel down, when we can step down, all these aids, and even aids when we want to do the clockwise chants around the wells, are all kinds of things that are made for purpose uh, at these wells. Now, what many people find intriguing much more than the concern for what saint venerated the well. Was it St. Patrick's? Was it St. Bridget? Uh, who was it? People are more concerned about something else other than the saint. And uh, so... What they're more concerned about than the saint, I think, is what cure is a well famous for. And uh, as I've said, local people regard the singular cure of a well is the cure. What is the cure of the well? You don't generally go to a, a well because you don't feel well. It has to be for something specific. You've got to know which specific well for which purposes, and this is something I'm going to explain why this is so. Um, and this is one of the information areas um, 
there's quite blurred from, from us. The wells have been shut off. They've been dug in. They're on private land with farmers. Even the farmers have forgotten what that well is for. So uh, people are researching into this, which is great. Uh, but modern education and modern medical availability has caused us to actually become disconnected from these wells. And that's why we no longer know where the cure is, what well it is that we go for a specific cure. Because now, if we're not feeling well and we want a cure, we go to a doctor, even the pharmacist will help us out. So we don't go to the wells. Uh, as far as we're concerned with most of us, the well is a peaceful, pretty place to go to. It isn't somewhere that we necessarily go to to feel better, except for perhaps some melancholy situations. So I find that fascinating. There are people around the counties now trying to find out from elders, seniors, what is known about the cure for what ailment at their local wells. And this is a very important quest, or it's going to be much more so uh, with Holy World's Revival in the broadcasting of doing, especially I, I hope to do my bit about, uh, do my bit as well. I'm not as mobile as I was, but I'm keeping in touch with people who are more mobile, who are researching these wells, trying to find them, trying to get information and get them archived and get them catalogued. And I do find it very warming and encouragement there's actually a lot more public money available in Ireland for doing this, especially this year. And uh, so people can actually get a grant and they can get some help to actually become more dedicated to finding wells around the country. It's not something where they just do their nine to five job and if they've got an hour in the evening, maybe a bit of time at the weekend, they'll do a bit of well hunting. Of course, you will get the hobby people that continue to do this, but people who've got a very keen enthusiasm, they can now get this grant, give themselves a bit of a salary to live on and really get tucked in to finding out about these wells and hopefully getting as many possible uh, revived, but at least interviewing local people and having more and more information to put in the archives and uh, to capture the locals' uh, memories of the wells, uh, situations like this. Most of the pictures are going to show a doom well. That's an old one. You know, not many people do that. Not many people go to the doom well for praying like that now or at any holy well. So it's picking up these stories. And what are they there for? What cure are they looking for? What are they praying for? What wishes are they hoping will come back to them? And during the future of um, Holy World's Revival broadcast, I will share interviews with people who are supervising such uh, projects. So there's going to be more and more of that as soon as I can pin people down for the interviews and get talking. Uh, be great. And I'm not going to stick to just around Ireland, too. This is not exclusively uh, a show about Ireland's holy wells. I'm talking more about Ireland's holy wells because I live in South Leitrim. But we're going to include elsewhere, Scotland, Wales, England. Uh, Estonia has got a, a huge collection of wells and other places around Europe. And people are telling me of their sacred and secret pools in the USA and Canada. So all this is going to be involved, and I hope some people in South America and uh, Africa and in the Middle East, I hope they'll come on board a bit with this. Obviously, I'm, I'm quite limited, but if you actually go looking for wells yourself or you know someone who does, no matter what country you're watching from, uh, please let me know or urge the person to let me know and let's feature them on a future Holy Wells Revival. Now, some of the cures that individual Holy Wells have been noted for as having exclusive healing, uh, warts, as I said, especially using the water from bottom stones, that uh, is certainly uh, a common one. And there's also uh, wells for headaches, eye problems, toothache, piles, coughs, mind and mental illnesses, especially melancholy, health and melancholy, people still go to the wells now uh, as an aid to calm them and release them from melancholy. Also healing broken bones, arthritis. Uh, there are even wells that said for curing baldness, but uh, I've gone to the wrong wells for that one. If anybody can tell me which of the wells for baldness, I'll, I'll have a go. And uh, also there's the one, I said I'll bring this back up again, are uh, the wells 
for fertility is this one again the tully well again uh because it said if women go up to that and they drink the water then within a few months they'll be pregnant they'll they'll show up that the baby's on the way and that's also said to be a well for curing broken hearts now before thinking about the possible unseen entities being present because that's another thing i've been talking about uh a bit of the science of the water underground with the wells and talking about the cures. But the people are there uh, because of a belief of unseen entities that may be present. Um, there's a lot to learn from the minerals of the well water. Um, as I was saying, they pick up all these minerals underground. So there's a lot to learn from that uh, because they pick up in abundance, they chelate it. All this happens before the water comes to the surface as a spring. And so the water is like pure nutritious medicine, really. Um, anyway, minerals, when they're naturally chelated in the water, they're far more nutritious and absorbing for us than trying to dissolve mineral powders in water or even ha have a capsule, a mineral capsule, and then we drink water to get it down and swallow it. In some situations, the human deed of adding powders or swallowing capsules with water can have a reverse effect on the intended effect. For example, calcium, uh, that can actually naturally chelate, especially here uh, with the limestone in Ireland, and the waters go through the limestone caves, and there's, uh, the, the, there's a lot of ions there for taking on charge. They take the charge of the calcium and it all becomes one. It's, and so if we drink that, that calcium is actually going to integrate with the rest of our bodies. And it's like calcium in food. And we get a good dose of calcium rather than try and pump it up with powders. Because the thing with powders, only a little bit is absorbed. Um, most of it will just go through the digestive system and go out the other end. Total waste of money. And sometimes uh, the, it'll actually pull the body other resources to get the energy to deal with the calcium. So it can actually have a weakening effect as well. And uh, calcium supplements, unfortunately, can actually clog us a little bit uh, as well. So not so good. Anyway, that's the basic science of the natural spring and holy wells. But um, for hundreds uh, and maybe thousands of people using the holy wells over hundreds of thousands of years, it's natural that the specific healing potential of a well will be recognized. And reason recognized is not so long back. People couldn't travel village to village, town to town like they used to. They didn't have cars. They didn't have good roads. They didn't have the public transport. So people were pretty much enclosed in their own community. And what we recognized when you did go over to another community is it, over a period of time with people perhaps drinking that local water, we always have that joke, oh, it must be something in the water. You know, you might find there's a health benefit, huge health benefit that everybody seems to have in a community, which maybe the next community doesn't have. Uh, you can get, uh, I was talking about calcium. You think of osteoporosis. People don't have arthritis and osteoporosis in one village, yet they got it really bad in another village. That may be due to the calcium, the chelated calcium in the water. Likewise, if zinc, if it was zinc in the water, you suddenly find that the birth rate in that village has gone up because there's a lot more stamina and, uh, it's a lot more rumpy pumpy and stuff, and uh, and it could all be down to the zinc in the water. And I speculate that um, once a health benefit was actually recognised to be abundant in a community, then of course you're going to get the uh, the opportunists, the entrepreneurs. They would come in, they'd be right onto it, and for at least a couple of thousand years, these entrepreneurs were also chertling. Uh, because for a while the churches, they had their um, guilds, didn't they? They have their uh, commercial guilds, especially Protestant churches. Uh, they were the, and those guilds thought 
they owned all of the trading and the business and the church got an interest in that as well so of course they would want to get an interest in what's going on uh, at these wells especially if there's uh, cures to be had it's a bit like the pharmaceutical companies today i suppose and maybe that's why there's a Patrick Wells uh, franchise. <laughs> uh, maybe that's uh, what that was. You know, pa Patrick was around fifth century. So they say they were quite adventurous. But the whole thing about St. Patrick's Well, that didn't really start happening until seventh, eighth, ninth century. And it wasn't really, I think, uh, was it um, Pope Gregory the Third? When was he around? Uh, eighth century. He was the one that started the caper. Uh, of um, of calling wells under the saints' name, so he started the whole tradition. And uh, I'm thinking of the word, the order, uh, doctrine of venerating wells under the saints' names. And of course, they'll make out, oh, uh, Patrick came here in the fourth century. Look into any religion; they're not going to actually form a religion over doctrines of their present day. They're going to take fragments of the past and say that's what they're copying and using because that's what happened in the past. But no, it's BS. It's just an excuse to give something for the present. So, from the eighth century, there was the Patrick Wells franchise, definitely well and truly in action, and that was all a bit like the digital world today. Eventually, it started free, but then there were subscriptions and and uh, you had to cross their palms with something anyway. So through these church appointed well, so there were managers, well managers were appointed to these wells. Uh, sometimes there were local self-appointed well managers, people that just turned up and they would convince everybody they were the well managers. And uh, these people then, people when they were visiting wells, the holy wells, they ended up finding themselves being greeted with a sort of gatekeeper. And that gatekeeper will have a uh, code of rules, uh, some practices and some various rituals and chants that you had to follow before you could even get access to the water. Now, by this, uh, I'm thinking of um, the clockwise, the Hail Mary. Uh, let's see. No, that's the wrong one. Let's see if I can get something. Uh, no, that's someone else. There you go. They go around in circles there. Clockwise and reciting their Hail Marys. Uh, our fathers and glory bees and then uh, the person in the middle will say cross my hand with silver some uh this will happen to some practices with well keepers cross my hand with silver and uh, many visitors to these holy wells they go in there for the healing they also want to take some of that water home for medicine at least and um and extra water for regular water needs, for drinking at home, because they didn't have taps and faucets in that time. And there'd be practices in place for ruling that. And sometimes the well keepers would not allow water to be taken from the wells and taken home. What had to be done was another well uh, dug nearby, and that had to be dug by hand. It wasn't being pushed up by nature. It had to be dug by hand so you got the diviners in the water diviners in to decide where the track of the well was going and then down go the picks and the shovels and all of that to build a well for the public to use take the water home and be charged for it no doubt uh, i would say now a common uh, some of the rules for people that were taking water to go home and this is this definitely put a limitation so there was two rules if you took, uh, this was quite common, if you took water from a well, a holy well or the one being made beside it, if you took it, there was two main rules. And one was you had to remain silent from the time you gather the well, from the moment you leave, and all through the journey home, and not a word until you've actually placed the water into your appropriate storage place at home. Second rule was, when you carry it at home, when you carry the water home, never, never, ever put your water container down on the ground before you get to where you are at home because the keeper of the well, uh, scaremongering, of course, will say that it'll be, your water will become toxic if you've actually put it down. So, of course, that's one way to limit the amount of water going home. Uh, it will be less than you carry because if you get tired and put it down, you'll believe that you've corrupted the water. And I also mentioned that one of the requirements uh, way back in many of these wells 
was the cross my palm with silver ritual. And uh, this was certainly so regarding access to any water. If you wanted to use the baths, whether it was the foot baths or the full submersion, you definitely got to do some serious crossing palm with silver with that. And I suppose the reckoning then was that there was no taxes taken to cover water expenses. Uh, all these conveniences have have been built, uh, provided for, and sometimes there were repairs if weather uh, upset them or people damaged them. So there's this ongoing maintenance and requirements. So I suppose they needed some coverage. But of course, profit was in mind as well and uh, to get something to cover. Anyway, I've mentioned uh, the sort of science and economics now. You know, I mentioned the chelating, mentioned the economics of the well keepers there. Uh, but most of us, when we become pilgrims and we go to such places like the holy wells and the, the springs, we're mainly focused on the spirituality. We think we may consider the presence of entities and also the psychicness of the presence of the wells. And there's this, um, can I bring her up now? Let's see. There's, uh, I'm trying to think of a name, Hannah. Something or other. Uh, oh, where does she live? Uh, she lives on the, uh, oh, one of the Inner Hebrides islands, Isla, Isla, Isla. She lives there. Let's see if there she is. And uh, she's right into the fairy face there. That's her fairy well. Oh, I can't remember what her full, her full name is. Uh, uh, anyway, Hannah. And uh, she comes from quite a, a line of people. Uh, her mother apparently was known as the local seal woman. And she would sit on the shore and uh, she would sing to bring in the seals and talk to the seals. And, of course, she believed uh, in the selkies and mermaids. So her mother, well, that was her world. And Hannah there is also a classic player, a small a uh, lap harp uh, player as well. And I believe her father might be. No, her mother was a fiddle player. I think father was a flute player. And there are fairy hills in Isla. And her father always regarded himself as being king uh, of the, the fairies. So <laughs> he would make sure the fairies are protected. So there's quite a family heritage that's involved with her. Uh, oh, you might know her name. She's quite famous. Uh, anyway, anyway, that I actually I just saw those. But I put those pictures up. I've got any more of her? Uh, yeah. Oh, that's another one. That's um, what do they call that person. Uh, the another folklore. Um, not frisky. <laughs> not pixie. Oh, I can't. I can't think of the name of that. Uh, that sets a haunt on the wells. That's down uh, in the wells. Uh, it sounds. It rhymes with piss, pixie, and I can't think of what it is. Again, you might be able to help me out on that one, but that, that's another folklore story of what you'll find in the wells. <laughs> right. Uh, what have I got now? Ah, oh yeah, with Hannah. This is uh, one of her paintings. I must show that. Uh, this She says she has dreams and visions of what the fairies look like, and that's Hannah's she believes in little folk like that. And she's she's quite an artist. She's got quite a collection of paintings that she sells and goes on to exhibition. I'll put it in the uh, comments. I'll think of a name a bit later on. Uh, but lives in Isla and has quite an intriguing website to tell you all about it. And, of course, the Crossman Farm with Silver attendant uh, at these wells also offers psychic services, similar services, to ensure the the cure is effective in addition to the water now these days um we know we can actually tune into well spaces we can do this ourselves we don't need a keeper of the well uh, if we actually use techniques of our own to be quiet and connecting uh leave any concerns leave our phones everything way away just be ourselves connecting forget about our linear life just connect with the vibrations the circles and uh, the spirals of what's going on. And we can do a lot of our own DIY healing with the use of being connected to our surroundings along with the water. Now, sometimes it does help to have a trusted friend present who can facilitate if we're not that confident 
about being present in a space. We can have a friend who can facilitate and share that. And sometimes people get together in healing circles, small healing circles around these springs and the holy wells. Now, last week, I was talking about curses at holy wells. And some wells will have a reputation of an effect that is actually between cursing and healing. Now, one such place uh, is a place called Toba Morag that's actually on Harris, the Isle of Harris on the Outer Hebrides. Uh, now, that, that's the wrong picture. It's, let's see. There we go. I haven't got the well itself, but there is a well around that uh, lock there. And lock over in Scotland's L-O-C-H, of course. In the Outer Hebrides. Now, this is quite unique. I think it's one or two like it. But uh, that, for that well, as I say, what is the cure of the well? The cure of the well that's beside that lock there is said to be the well that you go to when you lose your appetite. But unfortunately, people who've drunk there and kind of drink a bit too much, um, they report that they're actually still hungry after being in the wells, and they're always hungry, and they come away from the well after drinking the water, they just want to eat, 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 so the one thing that well is not good for is a weight loss well, uh, now there are some wells that after drinking the water, it feels like you've been drinking excess caffeine, because you end up getting the shakes, I don't know any uh, an example, but um, I've heard of that from people, some of the wells they went to, they drank the water and they had the shakes for about an hour as if it was like excess caffeine. Uh, but they are about anyway. And around the island, there are some wells that are said to have water that's impossible to boil. There's a lot of these. I know the, the people who look after the holy wells of Cork and Kerry, uh, they report uh, some of them. Do a Google on that, uh, wells of Cork and Kerry, and you'll find some articles on well water that's impossible to boil. The one I'm most familiar with is a well near Four Abbey. Uh, that's it. I think I'll bring that up. Uh, that there where the tree is, uh, the Hawthorne tree, I believe, that's actually stuck in a dry well. That well has gone dry now. And you can see Four Abbey in the background there. Uh, but the story is there is um, when the water is there, and you gather the water uh, to be drunk. People did gather that water to take home. And they take it home and they try to get it to boil. And, of course, boiling is bubble, bubble, bubble. And they can't get it to uh, boil. But funnily enough, it, it's still, you know, you leave it and waiting for it to boil. And if you don't check it, suddenly all the water has evaporated. The water from the, these wells, they evaporate without bubbling and without seemingly boiling. And as I say, there are quite a few are those type of wells with that folklore around Ireland. And um, overall, the number of wells people visit for healing is probably my, a lot less, about a third of the wells that are recorded um, by archaeologists' previous surveys. They've gone. They've been filled in by farmers generally. And uh, then, of course, there's a lot more. There's no public access. So I, I think uh, there's an estimation of only 20 to 30 percent of the original wells. Do we have any chance of access? And it's not always public access. Sometimes you still have to get permission with a farmer. And some farmers are very precious about the holy wells. They only allow certain people to be around them. Some of them they restrict to just local people. I know when we were, Claire and I were living uh, in near Cache in uh, County Sligo, there was one Cormac's well, which is very famous in the legend for Cormac McCart, uh, who they said was stolen from his mother at that well by a wolf and taken up to the caves. But to actually visit that well, uh, the only time that's allowed is through uh, the day of emancipation, middle of August. And then even then, it's fairly limited with how, which people were allowed to go there. So that's, that's an example where the farmer really censors who can visit and use the well. Uh, but now we have access to a range of health services, so it doesn't seem very important uh, to um, have hell, uh, you know, have holy wells that are there for the cure. But because more and more people 
seem to be trusting the health service less and the pressure on the health services as well is getting people frustrating. So they go there for a problem and they end up coming away with a mentally health, mental health problem because of the frustration of the overcrowded A&Es and no beds and so forth. Uh, the health service to a lot of people now doesn't feel like a complete and wholesome service anymore. I wonder if you agree with that one. This is one for you to put the comments down, I think. But the healing folklore of the wells is, again, becoming more and more popular. And the combination of integrating the holy well water or even a visit to the holy well is starting to feel as if we're applying ourselves in a much more wholesome way again. Now, some wells, the springs and bars, spas uh the healing pilgrimage tradition has never really gone away and a previous holy world revival explained what spa was that really is a protestant thing because they were totally against the holy wells but uh there was a compromise that um yeah, you know, okay, don't call them wells because they associated that from the past pagan times and they didn't want their people following the whole pagan stuff. So, but calling them spas and that was a center of improved health, you know, that's definitely in with the Christians all about bathing and uh, uh, being baptized and reborn again, all that type of stuff and keeping ourselves healthy. A spa was a good thing. So that's why I say spas, springs, and wells. Now, Tobinot Well, uh, there's a very popular one. This is by, uh, this is outside of Sligo, in County Sligo. And there we go. Very pretty. Every, everybody who visits that well is very moved. I see a lot of people, they're in tears. It's really an emotional, passionate place to visit. But very few people actually drink from that well anymore, unfortunately. Uh, I should be get, There we go. That's a close-up to the well there. Uh, but I tell you, you know, this sign went up. Please do not drink water in the well. And that's because the Sligo County, not so many years ago, I think it was about 10 years ago, discovered that the lead content in the water was too high for them to accept as being safe. So to protect themselves, the council, from people suing them, from getting water from the well, to cover their butts and their insurance policies, they put that sign up. And you don't see many people getting water from the well to drink anymore, which is very sad. Um, but people still use that a lot. They light candles. They ask for healing help. And they place prayers. Oh, I didn't have a picture of the rag tree there, but there's a huge rag tree there, very popular. Anyway, there's another one I want to move on to, and this is a very popular one in Flint, I think, Flint in Wales, uh, that's very well visited in pilgrimages. Um, I'll try and line this up. And this is St. Winifred's. It's, uh, the place is actually called Holy Well. It's in Flint in Wales, and it's a huge draw for pilgrimages. And there you go. Look at that fancy place. And uh, there's a sort of side view with a little bath there. And uh, then you go outside, there's another bath. I mean, it's got all the ingredients I've been talking about. It's foot pools, um, bathing pools, and there you've got it. Indoors and outdoor submersion pools. Uh, so that's really how many uh, holy wells and spas have that. I suppose bath does. But that, that's way ahead of itself. Some Winifreds, anyway. And uh, also wells for healing animals, I find very fascinating. Uh, there's um, there's one, uh, it's in Somerset, Dorting in Somerset, uh, at St. Aldelm's Well. I think I've got that there. There's St. Aldelm's uh, Dorting in Somerset. And I think I've got a wee video, if I look. Uh, I hope so. Um, so to give you a little bit of motion, bring you connected. Yeah, there you go. And that, this is our demo as well. There we go.
there you go a few seconds uh, there of uh, contemplation at St. Uh, Old Helms well doting in Somerset I think I've got another picture there sideways picture no that one hasn't come up oh there it is uh, well, there we go that's uh, a sideways picture of that right oh there's also uh, uh, in Ireland now this is uh, a shrown this is a shrown a city very pretty place to go it's it's all about Beldna, and there's this well here. I'm not going to go into the stories of that, um, but uh, it's a very important well for cleansing and purity, and the cattle used to be allowed to drink from that well after they'd been through the twin fires. I think I've got another one. It shows you, it's fuzzy, but it shows you a bit of the landscape. No, it doesn't, but that's it there anyway. And um, that well uh, in Shrone City, uh, the cure there is to ward off any clinging infections, especially off of cattle. That is an animal well uh, that uh, helps to ward off viruses, harmful bacteria. And it's very important, I'll show that again, uh, for the cattle, they said to drink from that because a builder, after they've been through the fires, drinking the water, they're then sent up into the hills and they... Uh, when they're up on the hills, uh, the daughters of the farmers are up there with them, looking after them, and they're milking them each day, and they're making butter through the summer. And it, uh, it doesn't come into what I'm doing with the Holy World's Revival, but it's amazing, the folklore uh, up on the top there, people down below growing their crops, going to mass and so forth, but the girls up above, they don't need to do any of that. They're just there having the crack, milking uh, the cows for the butter because that butter is collateral that they'll bring down and it helps to pay off the debts uh, when they come back down at Sawan. But lads from down below, uh, they get curious. I'm just going to go up to see so-and-so and see if she needs anything. I'll just take a little bit of food. And, of course, the lads, they get wooing because the priest is not looking at them up on the hills. And before they come down, they steal a bit of butter. And the story is there that, no, it wasn't the lads that stole the butter. It was the fairies that came along and stole the butter. Anyway, you just cannot uh, take an animal. That, that was an animal well that I showed you. But you can't take an animal to any well for healing. Uh, so you just uh, say, oh, it's a holy well. I'm going to take my dog to it or a cat. That's not quite on. Uh, we actually have a St. Patrick's well uh, near here, it actually has a dog well and a human well in the same place, which is lovely. But one holy well, uh, Toba uh, Theobat, uh, see if I can pronounce it, Toba Theobaton, um, apparently stopped uh, bringing humans. Uh, do I have a picture of this place? No, unfortunately, I haven't. But this holy well, Toba Theobaton, uh, Humans stopped using it because uh, a horse broke in to buy the well and it drank there because the horse knew it had a digestive problem. So it wanted to drink something uh, to help out its digestive problem. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think of the end of that story. Uh, on it. That's right. It just poisoned it. That was the full story that I've just told you in a roundabout way. After the horse had been there, anybody that went for the cure the cure didn't happen anymore. The horse being there stopped the magic of the well. There was another one I got here. I don't have the well, but I have the church nearby. This is uh, St. Edrin's. This is in Pembroke. No, it isn't. Come on, there we go. That's in uh, Pembrokeshire. And what happened there is a farmer, there's a well somewhere in there. I haven't got a picture of the well. But a farmer took his dog, and he's, he had an angry dog, and it kept biting people very angry, and he had heard that um, if he takes to the well, that, that well, this was uh, St. Edrin's well in Pembroke, was what the cure of that well is for humans. If humans are angry and they want revenge, you go and take water from St. Edrin's well in Pembroke, and uh, you would be calmed and you wouldn't be looking for revenge. And this time I thought, well, if it works for humans, it worked for my dog. So he took the dog, the dog lapped up some of the water, and apparently the dog was instantly calmed. But unfortunately, as soon as they left the well, 
The, the dog was okay, but the farmer died. He dropped dead there and then. Now, some wells, when they dry up in summer, it's also believed that um, the grass around the well has actually absorbed the well's healing power. So all is not lost. And this is another animal example. Uh, the farmers actually cut the grass that's on the outside of the wells. They dry it and they store it and they keep it aside, just like humans keep bottles of holy water aside. Uh, they they then feed this grass that they've cut uh, to their animals when their animals get sick because they believe that as this grass around the well has the healing powers that's been detoured into the grazing from the dry well. So and what we've got here, really, if you think about it, with the farmer's case thinking that the well's powers have gone into the grass, what is that? That's powers of faith. And if you saw me advertising this um, this addition, I was saying there was a third ingredient, and this is what we're moving on to, the powers of faith, imagination. Imagination and belief are an incredibly valuable integration into the healing power of holy wells. You might, Someone might say, ah, it's just a placebo. It's, ah, it's complete bullshit. Hang on a moment. People come away because of their beliefs. They come away much feeling much healthier, being much healthier than before they came. They can't really knock that. I don't think so anyway. Uh, now, most people know uh, the Chalice Well in um, Glastonbury. Let's get that up. This is me at the Chalice Well there, uh, holding on to the lid for some reason. Um, let's get you another couple of pictures on that. That's a close-up of the Chalice Well. I remember when that was overgrown and covered in brambles when I first went there. But here's another. I love this one. This is a, an old vintage one of people at that Chalice Well, and they're uh, kind of enjoying themselves there. And one of the healing benefits known, and I'm going to have a picture, I think. No, is it the one behind me? No, it isn't. Um, it's known to be good water for people with disabilities. And there's a story of a crippled woman who was working in a workhouse in Yeovil, which is not too far away. Let's see if I can get rid of that and get me on it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a crippled woman, can, uh, woman, she was working in a workhouse in Yeovil in Somerset. And she just wanted, fed up with this working, it was really hard work being crippled. And she just wanted the cripple, whatever it caused it, to be cured. And she'd heard that about the chalice well and the, and the, that would heal her. And the, the workhorse, workhorse, work, workhouse manager said, oh, I'll go down the chalice well and get the water for you. And you just keep working here. So the master of the workhouse uh, said, collected bottles, off he goes, supposedly, uh, to uh, Glastonbury, picks up the well water, brings them back, gave them to her. She drank the water between her work shifts. And each day, through drinking this water, she did actually become stronger. Her legs became stronger. Uh, she could walk a bit. And in the end, she didn't need any crutches. She was walking again just from drinking this water that the workhouse manager had got. And she'd never been as fit and vitality feeling like that for many, many years before. However, the water that the woman had been drinking daily, it hadn't come from the chalice well at all, but from a more local holy well. Unfortunately, the master of the workhouse was so pleased seeing this woman walking and uh, he admitted to her, no, that water wasn't from the chalice well. It was from the local holy well. You know, it just shows you. Uh, but unfortunately, she carried that belief, carried that faith. And uh, though the workhouse manager was saying what he did, admitting what he did as a congratulations, Boom, she was crippled immediately. So very sad that the bluff actually crippled her and she reached for her crutches again and she remained cr crippled. I would have thought the obvious thing is to make sure you got water from the uh, chalice well and have a go again, but that doesn't come into the story. Uh, but I talk about nearby uh, wells. There's a place, watch it. It's not that near. Watch it on the Seven Coast uh, in... Uh, 
Somerset as well. Is this well if I can get it up? Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's not the one I want. There's that well there. Um, now, I'm trying to think of the saint's name. I sh again, I should have got this. It's like the, the woman on the Isla. But the saint there, uh, again, I'll try and put it up uh, later. But um, a wonderful story there. Apparently, uh, well before he was a saint, uh, he was a local, what you were called now, an Druid leader. He was uh, in the area. And uh, he was job was to protect the people and uh, and teach them and so forth. But apparently Vikings came up the seven and uh, they cut off his head. And uh, he was able to pick up his head, wash it in this well, put his head back on and just carry on. And uh, the bishops of the area were so amazed by that and uh, that miracle, they decided to saint him. So that's how he, he ended up joining the um, the Christian church. I have to find his name, Deb, uh, De Deb, uh, Deborantus or something like that. And the, that one has a foot bath as well. Look at that. That has a well and it has a bath for people to dip their feet in, maybe to dip their heads in as well. So <laughs> that's in Watch It anyway in uh, Somerset. All right. Uh, now a common phenomena around. Oh, come on. That was too much. <laughs> the head's coming off of the lighting here. A common phenomenon around Ireland also is the dream of being cured at Holy Well. And uh, in the dream, the Holy Well and location is named in the dream. Now one well that seems to have come up in many afflicted dreams is one called St. Patrick's Well. It's in the... Uh, uh, Clonfad in Monaghan, and until the 1980s, that was a very well attended, very lively well. And according to mapspsychology.archaeology.com, uh, there's a lot of features there. They do have the well, and it shows that they do have the bath and the Boulogne stone, all kinds of things there. But I looked on the street view uh, on Google Maps, and there's just a bunch of trees where the well should be. Um, something like this. Um, this is from the Google Maps. I see the bunch of trees. That's where the well is. And there's not even an entrance from the road. There you go. That's going from another direction. So there's not an easy access to it anymore in a short space of time, really. Uh, and the local heritage group, apparently, they look after the church and the grounds, but they don't seem to bother with the remains of that holy well, maybe the uh, the farmers restricted access. Maybe that's what's going on there. But many people appeared at that well uh, because of their dreams, also by word of mouth as well. And there was even mass shared amongst those. Let's get it back up. Imagine that was mass was actually shared amongst where those trees are every Sunday. The, and the priest was also the well keeper as well. And the ritual there was to Put your hands uh, into the well water and rub yourself over with the water and then you would do the full chants, uh, the, our fathers, the Hail Marys. Um, let's get that up, boy. This sort of thing. This is from Etsy. You can get all three. If you don't know the words, you can go to Etsy and get all of these three. So you know for yourself and you can take them around doing your three Our Fathers, three Hail Marys and three Glorias. And then um, there was more dipping uh, by the people because this was a dipping well. And many people claimed to visit this well. Uh, it said that it sorted out their arms and leg planes. It was the cure for blemishes, bruises, brains, warts. So what is now a bunch of uh, trees now is um, sadly... No more. That's where people sorted out their arms and leg pains. So with stories and rituals of St. Patrick of Clonfad, there seems to have been an amazing connection to collective inspiration, I feel. All this inspiration coming to all these people in their dreams, the collective subconsciousness. I find that remarkable. It needs to be looked more into. And combine that, you know, the collective... Uh, Subconscious with your imagination and faith, as well as belief in following the priest's rituals. The first question to me is, why has this stopped and not been allowed to grow? 
during this past 40 years or less. Like 40 years, that was an active well. Now it's a bunch of trees with no access. Why has that happened? And second, how have the local people's vision, inspiration and faith suddenly gone away? Why is it suppressed? Why is there none of that healing uh, anymore? And though I started with a case uh, earlier in this broadcast about the chemical reactions of water being a huge healing medicine, I think a much larger medicine is our how we apply ourselves to the water and how we apply ourselves to the well. We can call it imagination. We can call it faith. But I believe this is all about allowing human spirit, our spirit from within, to connect. And there's never, ever going to be words of science to fully explain that. So those of you who know me will realize that I like the science and I like the hands on of applying and using the science as a tool. But I absolutely loathe science when it takes away vision, takes away our vision, our instinctive vision and instinct. To me, science doesn't work when we do that. Because without our instincts, our vision, even our collective self-consciousness, there would have never been observations to actually form the mathematics that has been applied and forever improved that science depends on. Vision created mathematics and the study of science. That's what came first. So to me, science shows a way and it provides us with a kind of valuable mapping. But to me, science is absolutely nothing without the instinctive vision and sensory perceptions. I believe if we try to replace, use science to replace our visions, on all our senses, and bellow words like facts, where are your facts, proofs, do your research. If we get into that kind of way of communication, then I think we've lost it, and that can be very destructive. Accepting and believing being present at the wells, and especially being present with the water at the wells, for me, being at that water, it connects and brings us into play with what is a very powerful healing bond. It brings us into play with the cure, as they say. So science often verifies some of this later. Good, that's fantastic. But I believe we will stay healed from the water and wells as long as we believe in it, not because of science telling us. So anyway, I think uh, that's as much as I can say on this. I'll tell you what's coming up. I'll repeat uh, nature folklore. Well, we're not, I'm not doing the nature folklore books now, but these Holy World Revival sessions and the nature folklore book series I'm doing and the sanctuary support, they're all brought to you by our subscribers. Thank you, subscribers, for your support. And uh, there's the Patreon link uh, that I use. That's where most people uh, help out. And if the Patreon tends to accept from PayPal, so people who don't like PayPal, they can go and just use a card through. Uh, that's a different thing. They can use their card through. Uh, my mouse says, no, you've got to go to pay. And here we go. That's the two of them. See the banner there? Buy me a coffee. Just use a card there. And that's just a website that's coming together, the Holy Re uh, Wells Revival. So I'll put that banner. That's buymeacoffee.com or Patreon. All helps. Dollar, pound, a euro a week, a month. All helps to collectively bring this show together so thanks very much uh for that uh now coming up uh we've got uh great things uh coming up on holy world revival the next wednesday hopefully i'll be live properly live again though it was live today i didn't stop uh 16th of november uh it's going to be finding hidden wells and uh, hopefully I'll show you how to do that and I'll have Donegal um, hopefully Catherine McGlynn of Donegal Holy Wells will be with us uh, for the, and then the 23rd of November uh, on a Wednesday too I'm going to be covering Guardians uh, Holy Wells so I'm going more into people that are, are like the well keepers but they're not necessarily in control they're Guardians and if I've got time We'll talk about one or two wells in County Mayo. Then the 30th of November, the subject is saints and shrines, you know, about the reverence and the venerating by the saints. I'm going to sort of explain that in a bit of detail, and maybe one or two of the wells I've visited in County Longford. 
So thank you. I've enjoyed uh, at last sharing you the Holy Wells revival of Healing at Wells. And if uh, you'll all be watching this as an archive, nobody was live just now. So keep the comments going and questions. I do return as often as I can to answer these comments. So if you're on the YouTube, please subscribe with the bell icon so you know what's coming up each week. So uh, I think the thing is enjoy. Yeah, I won't be back on the air for uh, six days, isn't it? So uh, enjoy. All the wonder of the water, all those inspirations and those dreams that maybe take you to wells, all those enchantments that comes with the presence of water. So until next Wednesday, uh, all I can say is have fun, play well, and that's the end for me. Thank you so much for being with me.